good. Well, I hope you have your Bible with you tonight. If you do, turn please to the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 14. I'll be dealing with a very important issue now as it relates to the canon of Scripture and what you hold in your hands, the Word of God. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Father, bless this book now, bless your holy word, and this messenger as I try to get it forth tonight. In thy name, amen. All right, you can go ahead and be seated. Now, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we have each Gospel has its own perspective on the life of Christ. A lot of very good men, very smart men, have tried to give you what's called the life of Christ or a comparison, comparing the four Gospels, to give you a chronology of His life while He was here 2,000 years ago. And they come fairly close, I suppose, but there's quite a bit of difference in it. And it's a hard thing to do. I do not believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was written to give you a chronological layout of his life. I do not believe that. I believe they give you a spiritual perspective as to who he was and why he was here. In Matthew, we have the burden of the whole gospel is the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me say this tonight. If someone tells you that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing, they may be good people, I don't question their motives and all of that, but they're dead wrong. They're two entirely different things. And uh, the kingdom of heaven has to do with the current Sermon on the Mount. It also has to do with the king offering himself as the king. And if you'll notice in Matthew chapter number 3 and verse 1 it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right? When Christ came, He came to His own first. He came to the Jew. Remember this. There's no way to reconcile it any other way except to understand chronologically how it works. Go not to the Gentiles, the way of the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. This is only for the Jew. Even the Syrophoenician woman, when she came to him and said, Lord, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he said, boy, this woman has shown more faith than all of Israel. But she was still a Gentile. He came with a ministry first to the Jew. They rejected the kingdom of heaven. But the Sermon on the Mount is the foundation or what you would call the constitution for the kingdom of heaven. It's important to understand that because there's an awful lot of people out there today that are preaching the Sermon on the Mount as if that is the gospel of the grace of God and it is not. There's nothing wrong with it. But it is not for this age. When they rejected their king, it was moved off into abeyance. Now let me show you something. In the book of Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 14, if you'll turn there with me tonight, look what it says. The Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. All right, so they had determined that he was demon possessed and they're going to get rid of him because he would take their place away, their nation. They even admitted that. So they wanted to get rid of this man. Should not one man die for the people, the priest said? So they wanted to get rid of him. Now look what follows immediately upon that in Matthew chapter 13. Look at this. Matthew chapter 13, once they'd held the council to get rid of him, look at Matthew 13, verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in what? Parables. The parables do not show up, folks, in your Bible until Israel, their leadership, had, had determined they were going to kill Christ. They were going to get rid of him. Okay? Now, if they're going to get rid of him, what happens to the kingdom of heaven? You have to have a king. The kingdom of heaven is a physical, visible kingdom. And the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. They're not the same. But in any event, the parable shows up immediately once they reject the king. Why? In the book of Matthew chapter 13, verse 14, keep reading with me and it will define itself. The scripture says, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, or Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, 
lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now, to understand why he quoted that, you, you need to go back and read Isaiah chapter number 6. That's where he quotes. And find the context. What's going on here? Why, why, when you quote in the New Testament, an Old Testament scripture, why? See, why? There's a reason for it. And so the reason, of course, is the fact that God had come to his people. His people had rejected the Messiah. And when they did, he blinded them. He went into parables, into what we call a parabolic state. Now, you don't find the word parable anywhere in the Gospel of John. But let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Look at Acts chapter number 28, verse 25. This closes the book of Acts. This closes the ministry of the Apostle Paul as it relates to the Jew. And look what he says to them. Verse 25, Acts 28. And when they had agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word. Now, here he quotes Isaiah again. He quotes it. And the Lord had quoted it. Now Paul quotes it. Well, spake the Holy Ghost to be Esaias the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, say, Hearing ye shall hear, shall not understand. Seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Do you get the import of what he just said? <laughs> yeah, digest that for a moment. God meant for them not to be saved. That's what it says. Lest they hear, and lest they see, and lest they be converted. No, God says, I'm going to close their eyes and their ears. Now, that begs the question, why would God do that? Well, the answer is in Romans 11, but let's keep reading here in, in Acts 28. Be it known therefore to you, this is a declaration, a proclamation, if you please. Be it known therefore to you, that the salvation of God is sent where? Well, now, had a Gentile been saved before this? What about Cornelius? Was not he a Gentile? Certainly he was. Was he saved? Absolutely. Sure he, sure he was saved. Gentiles had been saved before this. He's not saying now Gentiles can be saved. That's not what he said. What he said is now the direction of the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit of God is going to the Gentiles and not the Jews. That again begs the question, so what's going on with the Jews? You mean they're not included? You see this? And the reason is because God in his mercy had blinded them. And they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, had great reasoning among themselves. And I'm sure they did. And I'm sure the Jews that knew the Bible did. And I'm sure the Jews that knew more than the oral tradition did. And I'm sure the Jews who read the scriptures instead of listening to a bunch of garbage from a, from a rabbi they had they, the oral tradition, the basis for the Mishnah and the Talmud. I'm sure that they thought, well, I've got the Bible. I believe I'll read the Tanakh. That's what they called it. All right. Now, this is important. And here's why it's important. Because chronologically in the New Testament, the kingdom was offered first to the Jew, and it was the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven was never offered to the Gentiles. Not one time. See, not one time. And so they reject it, they refuse it, and God blinds them. So the first thing God does is call Saul of Tarsus, takes him to Arabia, and begins to reveal to him the gospel, not of the kingdom. The apostle Paul never preached the gospel of the kingdom. He called it my gospel, and he defines it for in 1 Corinthians 15. He gives you the details of it. But it's important to get that in context as I teach tonight. When you think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which gospel was the last one written? John. The canon of Scripture was closed anywhere from 90 to 95 A.D., possibly on up to 100 A.D., but I guarantee you the canon of Scripture was closed before you get into the second century. It was closed in the first century. And being closed, John's gospel and the same book written, the, the book written by the same apostle, the book of Revelation, finishes the canon of Scripture. All right, it's closed. It's closed. And uh, John writes it, and he closes it. But when we read the fourth gospel, it's not written to the Jews about the kingdom of heaven. The fourth gospel, John, which is the last gospel written long after the kingdom of heaven had been rejected by the Jews, and they've been blinded, is for anybody. Whoever reads this, you can be saved. 
These things are written that ye might believe. Not ye Jews, not ye Gentiles, anybody might be saved. But it's an odd thing, and you can do this on your, your computer when you get home. Do, a, uh, do a, a, a word search, concordant search of the Gospel of John, and you'll find that the word gospel doesn't even show up in the Gospel of John. That's strange. God does things in a way to make you think. Even though that is the gospel of the grace of God, without question, the word doesn't even show up in it. Isn't that strange? That's odd. God makes no mistakes. It's quite a remarkable thing of all the words that don't show up in the gospel of John. It's as if the Lord's preparing these people for something to come. And that something to come is the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is under attack today like he never has been before. All you have to do is Google his name, type the word heretic next to it, and you will find an abundance of people who declare that the Apostle Paul preached his own gospel and did not preach what Christ preached, and that therefore he created his own version of Christianity, and that most of the people going to the churches today have no idea what the real Christ or the real Christian faith is about. What, they, what they're teaching people today is that the Christian faith has lost its meaning because it is no longer what Christ taught. So what have we got now? We've got them pitting the Lord Jesus Christ against the Apostle Paul. What does that do? Well, anytime you have two sides, you've got to take one. So what they've done is attack your New Testament because he wrote half of it. You see the subtlety in this? You see it? Okay. Now, what I'm going to give you tonight now is a couple of things about what the Apostle Paul did when he began to preach and teach the Word of God as it relates to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and how he opened up the Gospels. That's what he did. He opened them up. He didn't close them. He opened them. For example, in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, the Scripture says, Now to him that is power to establish you according to my Gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Do I believe Paul? Do I believe we have a mystery that was kept secret? Well, here's the Apostle Peter, and I don't have time to run all the references, but turn to, don't have to do it tonight, but write it down. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter number 1 says plainly, the prophets of the Old Testament desired to look into these things and did not see them. They couldn't understand it. This goes in total agreement with what the Apostle Paul said when this was in secret. And what? The salvation that you enjoy today and take for granted, which is the salvation wrought by the coming of the Holy Spirit of God in power and unction from the right hand of the Father to bring conviction to a lost and dying world and to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. You don't hear much, you don't hear anything like that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's not in there. You see what I'm saying? But you see what they're kicking out? Do you see what they're attacking? In Galatians 2.1, the apostle said this, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem, Barnabas took Titus with me, and I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Now, here we go. But privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Well, there are three of them for certain that he communicated with, Peter, James and John. Because in the early church, these three names, Peter, James, and John, were head and shoulders above the rest. Okay? That's just, that, that's just a fact. And when you, the Apostle Paul said, well, I went to them. And he also, I'm sure, didn't get into the business of getting into detail with them. But here's what he thought in his heart. Peter, James, John, and all of you here in Jerusalem, you didn't have anything to do with my salvation. My salvation came from a personal experience, an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And I know that I was saved by grace through faith. And I know he called me to the ministry to minister to the Gentiles. Now let me see what you're preaching. And of course, you know the classic confrontation between Paul and Peter in Galatians where Peter had vacillated. He had given in to the Judaizers and he refused to eat with Gentiles, which at that time was a killer. That would have been the death knell for the church of God. And the apostle Paul said, I cannot let this escape. And so he confronted him over it. He confronted him and said, this is not going to get it. You can't do this. 
we know that we are saved by grace without any law whatsoever. And so it was. And that's the way it happened. And so the apostle said in 1 Corinthians 15, more for brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, but which also you're saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach to you, unless ye believed in vain. Now here we are, to the church at Corinth. He says, I'm going to declare the gospel. All right, now to make a statement like this, I declare the gospel to you. Don't you think that by making that statement, the Apostle Paul would include everything involved in the gospel? Don't you think so? Of course he would. He would not give you part of it and then leave part of it out. That's not going to work. That would make him look like a fool. So he says, I'm going to define it for you. All right, here's his definition. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Well, now there's something left out here, preacher. There's no baptism in here and there's no commandments. That's exactly right, because they don't belong in the Gospel. He just told you what the Gospel was. Remember, if you can destroy the Apostle Paul, then you've destroyed the Gospel of the grace of God. You've gone to the jugular of what this is all about. There are people out there in churches, for folks that are, uh, that are trusting the Ten Commandments or whatever commandments they think they can keep to save them and keep them saved. You cannot keep yourself saved any more than you can save yourself. Yeah. Only by grace. So now here's what he said about the blood. In the book of John, chapter number 6, the Lord said, Except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part in me. What if we'd left that? What if there were no epistles of Paul? What if all we had was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Think about it. You'd get real confused about the blood, wouldn't you? Even though the text says in John 6, now, he said, The words I say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I mean, how am I going to drink his blood 2,000 years later? And how am I going to eat his flesh 2,000 years later? Do you think he knew that generation after generation would follow him and that 2,000 years later there would be people living on this earth? So the Catholics do this. They take the wafer and they take the wine and they trans. In other words, they bring it from one place to another. Substantial, in other words, substantial. Give it, con give it consistency. So it's called transubstantiation. And so therefore the priest, uh, however he does it, he turns that wafer into the body of Christ and he turns the wine into the blood of Christ. Okay. And it is, a, it, is, it is spiritually supposed to be his body and blood, but not in a bloody manner, I think is the way they define that. And so therefore, here they are, week after week, taking the blood and taking the body of Christ, as they say it. And they are receiving Christ into themselves by their faith. They're receiving him because they've got the blood and, they've got the, and, and they have the wafer. Problem number one, you only need to be saved one time just one time. Okay, there's no sense in this world, whatever, to repeat it time and time and time again. Number two, you're not going to turn anything into the blood of Christ. You're not going to do it. You're not going to turn a wafer into his body. You're not going to turn wine into his blood. That's blasphemy. Amen. Number three, you've completely misunderstood what the message of John 6 is about. Completely misunderstood it. At that time, 2,000 years ago, did you see anybody take a knife and cut a hunk of flesh off of his arm? I mean, they were there. They didn't have to transubstantiate anything. All they had to do is whack a piece of meat off, stick a needle in, well, I didn't have any needles back then, I guess, but pull some blood out and have them, uh, have them some blood and flesh, and they're saved. Do you believe that's the gospel? Well, of course not. And you're not receiving Christ when you do that. And this is where the Apostle Paul shines. He says this in John 19, The Jews, therefore, because it was the Sabbath, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. All right? There's the cross. Let me go to the blood because I've already mentioned the blood. Let me get back to the blood. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Romans 3, verse 24, Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
he starts using big words now, propitiation, redemption, things like that, justification. These, these words are not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, see? But you look up, what does redemption mean? What does propitiation mean? What does hilasmus, which is translated uh, atonement, what, what, what do these words mean? Well, this is what Paul is called to do. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. What does that mean? That means to bring two warring parties together. That's what a propitiation is. It means that now they can drop their swords and they can come together. And this is what the apostle said in 2 Corinthians, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Be ye reconciled to God. He's no longer angry with the wicked every day. I know well-meaning people say that. But my friend, he is at peace. And it, it's good that it starts like that because he's the one that made you. He's the one that allowed sin to come into existence in the beginning. Have you ever thought about that? Of course. So he's the one who will re remedy the situation. And so you have propitiation, redemption, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. In 5.8, he said, Romans 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, here's another word, justification, all right? But think about what he just said to you. How can you just be justified by, justified by his blood if he died on a cross and bled, and, bled, and bled out and the blood of Christ is no longer in existence? See? And there's not a word anywhere in that New Testament after you get from John chapter number six, anywhere in that New Testament that says you're drinking the blood of Christ. You won't find it. It's not in there. It doesn't exist. Nor are you eating the blood of Christ. But the Apostle Paul said Christ is our Passover. See what he did? He took that and made an analogy out of it. He compared the Passover lamb of the book of Exodus while they were in Egypt, and he made an application of that to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Passover. Who did that? That's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Passover now. The Lord Jesus ha sat down and they had the Lord's Supper, which was at that time the Passover Supper. But the Apostle Paul is the one who spelled it out and laid it out that he is the Passover lamb. So in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, after the same manner, he took the cup which he'd supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. All right, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Can you read into this? Can you see, well, look at what you're reading here. This is the New Testament in what? In my blood, right? Was blood in that cup? No, there wasn't any blood in that cup, that was wine. But he just told you, he just told you that we're taking the Lord's Supper, all right? And the New Testament, this wine represents my blood, okay? But you're not drinking my blood because this is the new covenant. And that, you know, that's an amazing thing to me, how you can get so messed up on something like that. Ephesians 2.13 but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. It brings you nigh. We have redemption through his blood. We can enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And then he says, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So the writer of Hebrews, which is more than likely the apostle Paul, said very clearly that all of those sacrifices made in the Old Testament when they brought them and they were obedient to bring them and the blood was shed, never completely cleansed their conscience. When they walked away, they still had a sense of guilt. And because the blood of an animal cannot remove the guilt. So when you receive the Lord Jesus as your savior, one of the first things that leaves is guilt. Isn't that wonderful? But it could never be done under an animal's blood. It had to be the blood of Christ. So who told you that? Paul, Saul of Tarsus. So he develops the doctrine of the blood. That's important. And then the doctrine of the cross. The apostle Paul develops that doctrine, John 19, 31, because it was the Sabbath day, besought Pilate they might, his legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. 
1 Corinthians 1, 17, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, if, the God, if baptism is part of the gospel, this is a confusing thing, right? Of course it's not. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Okay. Now what kind of cross are we talking about? If all I talk about is a wooden cross, then this is not what Paul's talking about. Paul is talking about what that cross represented. What God saw in it and what it meant. There was more to the cross, in plainer words, for all those people standing around and were, and were physically present, eyewitnesses of his crucifixion, probably not one out of 10,000 had a clue what that cross really represented. They didn't know, but Saul of Tarsus did, because when God took him to Arabia, took him to the top of that mountain, the same place probably, I say this, but I can't prove it, but the, probably the same place that Moses got the Ten Commandments, he took him there and he revealed the gospel of the grace of God and he began to show him the mysteries as they relate to the church. So the Apostle Paul gives to us a great blessing and a great revelation. He tells you this, he uses the cross in this kind of sense in Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look what he says with it, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Well, I wasn't on the cross, neither were you. Nobody else was on the cross with Christ. Christ was on his own cross. Nobody, he didn't share it with anybody. But look what Paul said. Paul said that I'm on that cross in a spiritual sense. And as Christ was crucified by this world, I'm crucified unto this world. So there's a spiritual world that takes physical things and makes spiritual applications of it. And if you get a hold of the spiritual application of it, it sets you free. Because you realize you're no longer under the control of an ecclesiastic thing or men or approval somewhere. You begin to open up your heart and your soul. You think, good night, man, if God set you free, you're free indeed. And you are. You are. You don't need somebody waving something over your head saying, I absolve thee of all your sins. No, Christ absolved them because he washed them at the cross. He has washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1 5. Lao or Lauo. You remember I told you about that the other day. Lama, uh, Lambda, Omicron, Omega. Greek has two O's. <laughs> you have one O that looks like an O in smaller case, and then it's an O that looks like a W. So you've got Lambda, small O, and then a W. What that is is La O, okay, with the two O's. But if you add another syllable, you've got La U O. You add Upsilon to it, and you've got an entirely different word. Lao means to loose, turn him loose, set him free. But Lao means wash him. All right? So what do you get? Does anybody have a different translation in here tonight of the King James Bible? More than likely, if you do, Revelation 1 5, here's what your Bible says He hath loosed us from our sins in his own blood. And well, your Bible says he hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. And you cannot wash somebody from their sins in his own blood if his own blood does not exist. And it certainly does. And it exists not only in a physical but a spiritual sense. And there's a physical world and a spiritual world. There's great truth in that. You take hold of it. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. <laughs> Do you think any of those people standing there that day had any idea what Paul's talking about here? Well, of course not. This shows up decades later when the apostle begins to write these epistles of the New Testament. So what's the point? Point is very simple. The apostle Paul took a cross, a piece of wood that Christ was crucified on, and then he began to raise it to a spiritual level in the sense that he defined what was going on on that cross. A man died, yes. He gave his life for us, yes. The God-man bowed his head and Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, yes. The Apostle Paul told you what all that meant. And that's what, that's what you get from him. But here's, here's something that, uh, that's important about progressive revelation. You know, and I've told you before, time and time and time again, that the Bible is a book of progressive revelation. And that is that 
He said in John 14, in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. All right, it's simple. He's coming back. Does the New Testament say any more about him coming back? Oh, yes. It says a lot more. But now where is this said? The gospel of what? John. Okay. Now, in plainer words, they were taught from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ himself that he's coming back. Amen. Amen. He's coming back. And of course, you and I both know tonight, he cannot lie. Amen. But how does he come back? Is it a one-time event? Or is it a successive series of events? There's a thing called the rapture and the revelation. All right. And there's a very good possibility that there is a, another rapture in the book of Revelation that takes place about le chapter number 11 when the two witnesses hear the word come up hither. The same thing that you hear at the first part when the church is called out. Where does that come from? Paul. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. He said, I'll show you a mystery. All right, here again. When the word mystery shows up in the Bible, start asking questions. All right, where did this come from? How does this mystery apply? What does this mystery tell me that was not already known? See, where, where's the, where, this mystery, who, get, who got this mystery? Where'd they get this mystery? All right, now look what the mystery relates to in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. It's appointed a man wants to die, right? But the apostle just said, we're not all going to sleep. Of course, sleep is a euphemism. A euphemism is a word that doesn't have quite the bite. <laughs> you know, he's, he's gone. He's dead. Well, the Bible says he sleeps. They that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's a euphemism. Instead of saying dead, say sleep. All right, now look at this. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, wait a minute here. He said, I, if I go away, I will come again to receive into myself that where I am, there you may be also. So they had every right to look for the second coming of the Lord. Every right. But what's going to happen with the Apostle Paul? He's telling them, I'm going to tell you how it's going to happen. In 1 Thessalonians 4, in verse 13, he said, but I'd have you to ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Okay. Now, I've been in this graveyard so many times I forgot long ago how many funerals I've had in this graveyard, all right? And I don't know if you realize how close we are. You can walk out here in the back and pick up a rock and you can throw it into that graveyard. That's how close you are, all right? But there's not a single soul sleeping out here in this graveyard. No, sir. No, sir. Not a soul, not a one. Yeah, and yet, there's an awful lot of people out there that believe in soul sleep. They believe in soul sleep. But you don't get that from the Bible. Look at this. Concerning them which are asleep that we sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now that's part of the gospel. If we believe that he died and rose again. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will he bring up from the ground. Did I put my private interpretation in there? What does it say? What did he, what did he do? He'll bring them with him. What's that mean? That means they, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now that's comfort to me. I'd hate to think that I go out here in this graveyard and the souls of my loved ones are out here in this graveyard. And you know, it's not uncommon today for them to go and bulldoze a graveyard sometimes, dig it up and build an apartment complex. And down there in Louisiana, where they bury the, this is an entirely different situation. The ground in Louisiana, so much of it is saturated, they can't even bury people in it. And they had a hurricane come through there. It was, uh, what was that big one that hit uh, New Orleans? Uh, Katrina, right, Katrina. They had, folks, they had caskets floating all over the place. I mean, it's a horrible thing. Can you imagine your mother's casket? 
or a, or a son, a daughter, husband, wife, that's awful. You couldn't imagine anything worse, all right? So it floats, and then it hits something, and it busts open, and whatever's inside comes out. Where's their soul? You see, I don't believe in soul sleep, and I don't believe anybody in here does tonight either. But he will bring them with him. That means they're with him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now hold on. He just told you that they that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And now he says the dead in Christ are going to rise. Well, there it is, preacher. I found a contradiction in the Bible. Did you really? Do you know what you're made of? Do you know what you are? You're a tripart being. You've got a body. You live in it. Use it until you wear it out and get done with it, and you'll pass it off. You have a soul. That soul operates within that body, dealing with the body and the spirit, because the soul has a mind. And that mind can flip spiritually, or it can flip to the Satan. So you have to renew your mind. But then the spirit, which is what you are, you see the spirits of just men made perfect in the book of Hebrews. We are spirit beings. So well, how do you define the being of a human being? You, the spirit being of a human being, you cannot because you don't know the essence of a spirit. In John chapter number three, <clears throat> I believe it's three, it talks about they were born born again, maybe somebody knows where to go to that. I'm just pulling it off the top of my head. But it was talking about the people that, that were with Christ in heaven, but, and yet they're still alive on this earth. How many have read that? Yeah. Get home and read it. I want to make you think. That's what this is all about. Making you think. Make you think. Okay, you remember when Rhoda went to the door? Rhoda? They were praying for the Apostle Peter. You know, they, he thought they were going to chop his head off the next morning, so he thought, well, I'll get a good night's rest while I'm waiting. And he was asleep, and the angel had to kick him and say, wake up. <laughs> but listen, his ang his, his, she thought, when she said, Peter's at the door, the Jews said, no, it's his angel. What's that mean? That means that they were saying, well, what you saw was probably a spirit representation of Peter. In other words, how many of you remember the uh, Halloween we just came through? Pretty close, you'd remember it, wouldn't you? The subdivision I live in, this, there's one house in particular. He's got haints hanging all over the place. My grandfather and grandmother used to talk about a haint. How many's never heard never heard the word haint? All right. Well, <laughs> that's an old colloquialism for spirit, and some call ghost. When you start talking about ghosts, be careful because you don't want to sound like you're crazy, and so forth. But there is a holy ghost, right? Exactly, there is. So you understand the spirit world as God reveals it. Here's my point, without him hawing around so much. This angel, the Bible says the, the children, says their angel doth behold the face of our Father which is in heaven. While they're alive on this earth, their angel beholds his face. All right? A spirit being is not limited to one place. That's the key. And God is a spirit being that can be everywhere at the same time. Everywhere. That doesn't mean he goes there. He is there. And this is why David said in Psalm 2, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. So what I'm trying to do is to show you tonight how a spirit being is not bound by the laws of physics. Not in any sense of the word. He's not bound. So all of that's to say this. The body that's in the ground one day will come up a glorified body. 1 Corinthians 15, he said, that which is sown natural be raised supernatural. That which is sown mortal shall be raised immortal. That which is sown as weakness shall be raised in power. Read 1 Corinthians 15. And it talks about the body, the body, the body, the body, how it's going to come up. See, it's not going to be what was sown. It's going to come up. But the body is still not you. The body comes up, and they that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You're coming out of the heavens, and a body's coming up from the ground, and the two of you unite. 
And then you in that body, and Paul and the Apostle Peter, uh, uh, John said in 1 John, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We don't know yet. But we know when he appears, when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So John left it alone. He didn't get too far into it. But I'm telling you tonight, you cannot kill my spirit. You can't do it. You can't kill your spirit. It can't be done. So you have eternal life. If you're born, if you're not born again, then you've got a dead spirit. Dead as it can be. Dead to God. Dead in every sense of the word. You are incapable of appreciating anything spiritual from God. See, in that sense, it is dead. But the scripture teaches that the spirit, not the soul, but the spirit goes back to God who gave it. Remember? When God breathed into Adam's nostrils, did he breathe a soul into his nostrils? No. He breathed his life, his breath. And that breath is his spirit. He breathed the spirit of life into the nostrils of Adam and he became a living soul. And see, that's the mystery of a human being. Great's the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Well, they changed that one too. Great's the mystery of godliness. He who was manifest in the flesh. I hope I haven't rambled on so much tonight to confuse you. And because with all of my soul, I'm trying to show you that you're a whole lot more complicated than, than, than this world would give you credit to be. And so we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now here's what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. This is important. Uh, in, this is what we'd call eschatology. This has to do with the doctrine of last things. Watch what he says here. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 1. But of the times and season, brethren, you have no need that I write to you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of Christ so cometh as a thief in the night. So you're shaking your head. What did I do? Well, these new Bibles doesn't make any difference. I know they don't. They don't. The word Lord is translated from the Greek word kurios. Okay, kurios. The word Christ is translated from the Greek word Christos. You've heard that a thousand times. Christos means Messiah, Mashiach. That's the Hebrew word, by the way. Messiah or Mashiach is a Hebrew word, and it's the anointed one. That's what it means, the anointed one. So what the apostle is telling you here in 1 Thessalonians 5, we're going to be dealing not with the day of the Lord, uh, as they teach it, but with the real day of the Lord which is the tribulation period and the millennium, the thousand years that follow it. So it runs for a period of a thousand and seven years. That's the day of the Lord. But here's what he says. Now look at this. And every Christian ought to take great comfort in it. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Do are they crying for peace and safety right now? You better believe it. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. That that day, what day? The day of the Lord, when they're crying for peace and safety, should overtake you as a thief. Ye are children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep. This is spiritual sleep, as do others. But let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, for in helmet the hope of salvation. Now look at verse 9. This is so important. For God hath not appointed us to what? All right. Every time that the Bible mentions salvation, it's not necessarily talking about the salvation of your soul. It may be talking about the salvation of your life while you're here. And there's a difference. Okay? When the Bible talks about the wrath of God, in the book of Revelation, they cry out, the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The tribulation period is the day of the wrath of God. Okay? Not hell. Tribulation. Not hell. So what he's saying, I'm saying that the Apostle Paul just told them 
You don't have to worry about the tribulation seven year wrath of God because you are going to be, now look at this, he hath appointed us, hath not appointed us to wrath, but obtain what? Notice how salvation is used here. Okay? This is not the salvation of your soul. This is the salvation of your life. This is when he comes to get you and take you away before you go into the wrath of God. By our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. The whole context of this, the whole context of 1 Thessalonians is coming of the Lord to catch up those that sleep in Jesus. He brings with him and then those that have died, they bring up from the grave the body and they meet and they are not appointed to wrath. They're not going to go into the tribulation period. They're not going to suffer that. They're going to be caught up with him in the clouds and in the air. And this is the mystery that he gave you in 1 uh, Corinthians 15. Now this is the revelation. And I'll read this and close tonight. Revelation 19 verse 11. I saw heaven open. How do you open heaven? I saw heaven opened. And behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and brings peace. What's it say? You mean the Lord Jesus can make war? You better believe it. There's a day of grace and that day is quickly coming to an end. Then there's a day of wrath. There's a day. And now note carefully, it's not the wrath of the Father. When they talk about the wrath of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus said, all judgment has been given to me. He earned it, bought it, paid for it. And so now the one who walked in this earth, like you do, breathe what you breathe, eat what you ate, sleep where you sleep, hurt like you hurt. He lived among men for 33 and a half years or so. That's the one who's going to judge you that live on this earth. And he has every right to do it because there's nothing you can hide from him. So I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he that judge and make war. His eyes a flame of fire, his head many crowns, he had a name written, no man knew but he himself. Quite a difference between him that showed up in Revelation 1, isn't it? In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and lean. Clean? Army? Yes, they're coming to do war, to make war. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And this is the stone cut out of a mountain that is coming to smite this image of Daniel. He's coming to smite it, the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He doesn't ask permission. <laughs> he just takes what's rightfully his, and he treadeth the winepress and the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the revelation, folks. And every eye shall see him. They'll see him. I believe in the tribulation period he's going to appear to the Jew. By the way, how many of you have observed how God is preparing the Jews now to look up? How many of you have noticed that? Have you noticed that? Do you understand that some of the richest people in this country who have an enormous amount of wealth are Jews? They are liberal Jews. Have you noticed how now that everything that they thought that they could trust or believe in or would be their friend and so forth has turned on them? Have you noticed that? And they're going back to the pogroms of the past, the night crystal knock, they call it, the night of the broken glass in Germany. When the Jews that were left in Germany, the many Jews that got out because they knew what Hitler was bringing into that nation. But Crystal Knock was the night that they busted the windows out of their shops, wrote Jude on it, and it was that night that they officially began to persecute Jews. And Jews are saying now, we remember Germany. Maybe we better start looking around. Maybe we better not make the same mistake that our fathers and grandfathers made. Maybe we better start looking around at all this so-called anti-Semitism. And maybe they're right. And maybe they'll start praying a prayer that they haven't prayed in a long time. They may be praying for the Messiah to come. 
Yeah, right. Because in my lifetime, my little short span on this earth, I have never seen hatred for Jews like I see it now. There's reason for that. And there's another thing that's going on with it. And praise God for that. I'm listening. Amen. <laughs> my goodness gracious. Russia is aligning itself with Iran. Turkey has already threatened to come into Israel. You've got these nations aligning now. When nations begin to align themselves, they are preparing for war, folks. That's what that's about. They're preparing for war. And this is where the Lord comes back to get us. Because we're not going into the wrath. We're leaving out of here. Well, how do, you, how do I know I'm going, preacher? If you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. Well, I've got my church, my catechisms, and they laid hands on me, and they confirmed me and told me I was all right. Yeah, well, you go to bed at night, and you know you have no peace. And you've wandered for years out here in this world in a spiritual desert, and you don't have a clue who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And tonight would be a good time. Uh, not tonight, while you're here, you've heard a message on the second coming. And to, and to, I firmly believe everything the Apostle Paul wrote is Scripture. Does anybody know a place in the New Testament where one of the twelve, you remember who he was? He said that what Paul wrote was Scripture. How many of you remember that? Anybody know? He's one of the twelve. Who? Peter. You better believe it. As our brother Peter, he wrote, Peter said he writes Scripture. Yes, yes, that's quite a thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah, a revelation from God. Lord, bless your word. It goes forth with purpose you intended. It will not return void. And I pray it tonight in Jesus' name. And amen. All right. Lord willing, we can meet in here Sunday now. Sunday school will be 10 o'clock. The worship service at 11. And like our brother said tonight, I'm looking forward to the Holy Ghost showing up in his house. I'm looking forward for freedom and unction and anointing and worship and coming to the house of God and for Temple Baptist Church to be blessed by the presence of the Lord. That's what I'm looking forward to. And I hope you all pray to that end and pray that God comes and meets with us this coming Sunday. All right, let's stand up. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. Do you have one? Okay, brother. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Boy, that's no good. All right. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right, amen. Okay, let's have prayer. Thank you, Lord, for letting us come to your house tonight. Thank you for the sweet Holy Ghost and for blessing my soul and for being with me this morning when I needed you the most. You haven't failed me. You never have. You've never left me. And I bless your sweet name for that. I pray you'd give me the message now for Sunday. I pray you'd give me unction to preach it. And Lord, I pray that you'd use it, Lord, for your glory and reach the people that you want to reach with it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Be careful, folks.